and program on Other Than Earth 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The following program contains opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Veterna Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed without any censorship and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. Killer Taxes and the New Narrative Sri Lanka's middle class is now facing the first taxation on their income for 2023 as per the recommendations by the IMF. Why? Well, the IMF, along with their Colombo liberal slaves in unison, sang that these taxes were going to fix Sri Lanka. But soon, you will know, these measures will break the middle class, increase the poverty sector and all in all, fatten the 1%, making them super rich. With the payee taxes coming into play, people across the country are asking, how can we live like this? Well, to make sense of it all tonight, I will speak to Professor at the California Institute of Integral Studies, Professor Asoka Bandaragi, National Security Specialist and Author, Professor Rohan Gunratna, Former Finance Minister, Dr. Saraf Amurugama, and Former Foreign Affairs Minister, Rohita Bogulagama. Good evening. I am Mahesh Johnny, and this is a State of the Nation. Hello everyone, good to see you. Thank you very much for spending your evenings with us. We have a packed show for you tonight, so let's get right to it. Well, one night I was scrolling aimlessly on YouTube, watching videos on how to uh, make food because I don't know how to cook. And I think the YouTube algorithm got me to a video with the title, What Happened to My Country? I'm not interested in telling you uh, about the contents of that video, but that question got me thinking, what did happen to my country? We have all the resources possible, a country like no other. A country that has everything, yes, everything. How come we cannot make this country work? We have a rich culture, a rich heritage and religious guidance that the whole world is seeking. A climate to boast about, be it cool, be it warm, anything within a span of three or four hours. Be just to die for, a working class that is formidable and robust. Natural resources the world is looking for, Ayurvedic medicine, that is unique only to Sri Lanka, and many, many, many more things. And yet, we screwed it up. Well, when the blame game went around, we blamed the politicians, we blamed the authorities, we blamed regional actors, we blamed global politicians, poli uh, global politics, we blamed China, we blamed COVID. We blamed each and every one we could find. So, accordingly, we needed to be on the right track, isn't it? Because after all, we found the culprits and blamed them. So now ask the question, why is it not so? The reason is very evident. We haven't blamed the biggest culprit of all yet. Us, our minds and our way of thinking. If we blame the politicians, then ask who got them to power? If we accuse the authorities, then ask who got them uh, go scot-free without holding them accountable? If we blame the regional actors, ask why we were silent when their affairs were affecting our way of life. Finally, if we blame geopolitics, then ask why we were so clueless about what was going on and didn't take the necessary precautions. Right now, the narrative is as such, the clowns of 2015 to 2019 and their puppet masters who managed to get rid of, a, get rid of one nationalistic president back in 2015 by investing heavily in the opposing candidate, managed to do it again in 2022 to secure their investment. And now the same repeats with a new set of fools who slave them. So the question is pretty simple. Are we letting them defecate on our way of life again? Or are we going to do the same? 
if we are going to keep quiet and turn a blind eye to the BS agenda that's going to take center stage very soon, then in a few years' time, know that you too may have to deal with BS like this. I, I got to say, there, there's kind of a basic irony here. I mean, you're what? lecturing us about sexism while you're sitting right now in Manhattan. Manhattan. We need to rename the city then. Um, the, yeah. the, the, the Big Apple. The Big Apple would be less offensive. So I feel that I'm sitting in the Big Apple, not Manhattan. So um, they're trying to avoid the word man. So as, if we can eliminate that word, then things would be much better and people would be less offended. Well, what if you lived in Manchester, Vermont? Well, they would, might have to change the name of the city uh, if people agree with Purdue University. And Purdue University found that things need to be updated, and they updated their writing guide to take out these words that apparently are offending certain groups of people. Okay, so just to make sure I understand the yeah. rule, if mm -hmm. something offends somebody, even yeah. if you've never met that person personally, right. Right. You have to change it. So doesn't that mean that a small group of super unhappy people get to control what the rest of us say and think? Well, perhaps they're ahead of their time. Maybe this is something that is offending a small group, but the group's going to get larger and times are changing and our language is dynamic. Webster keeps adding right. new words in the dictionary. So our language needs to change. And a term that used to be non-offensive, like man made and male man now needs to be changed. Do you think they would have the guts to go to Gold Man Sachs in New York and say, change your name now or else? They probably wouldn't shop there. They probably wouldn't shop there because <laughs> what if they were because shopping the name, at Goldman Sachs, they the might name. come up short because it's a bank. Because the name man is adult male and yeah, we need to we need to change it. Manhattan. We had to get rid of it. Uh, the question for you and me here in Sri Lanka is that are you okay that these clowns will turn our country to be just like what's happening in America? If you are not, then we have to do something about it. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. By now, most of you would have received your salary for January 2023. Are you happy with the taxes that has basically taken one third of your salary? Are you thinking, how on earth are you going to live in the coming months? Obviously, you may have to cut down on many things that brought some joy to the life that you have right now. Sometimes you may have to drastically move towards a new setting to afford this new reality. Perhaps you may have to change houses because the current rent is way too much for you to afford after the new taxes. To look at how we got to this debacle with the pay tax, we need to look at the source and follow in our footsteps from that point on. The IMF agenda to push harsh, harsh taxes wasn't a novel idea. It was exposed through the staff agreement uh, um, with the IMF announced in September of 2022, last year. Now, before Gotabe Rajapaksa's tenure, there was another program in the works with the IMF from 2016, pushing for the same policies that are being implemented right now. Remember the period from 2015 to 2019 where you uh, even had to, when you were withdrawing your own money from your own bank account, you were taxed five rupees. Remember the best finance minister in Asia? Yes, those were the hearty and handy works of the IMF. Liberals, remember your lord and savior, Dr. Harsha De Silva, coming on television to say, well, nothing much we can do. We are taxing more to pay the debt. <laughs> Well, that was uh, Dr. Harsha De Silva during the time when they were in power, I think, uh, uh, from 2015 to 2019 in the UNF government. Now, as a nation, we forget, don't we? 
in 2023 that, the Sri, that is the Sri Lankan way. Since Sri Lanka is considered to be a high-risk country due to the Hail Mary move to default by the hero of the Colombo Twitter liberals, Professor Albus Dumbledore of the Central Bank, the IMF is positioned better to dictate more intrusive and backward policies, giving Sri Lanka fewer choices to negotiate. The IMF is using its traditional playbook, and we are dancing to its tune at the expense of a general public with no reason to suffer on this scale. The solutions they used during that time resulted in the crippling of the SME sector, reduction of our production, and recorded one of the lowest GDP growth rates ever witnessed in this country, in our history. I'm not making this up. This really happened back in the period from 2015 to 2019. Do your own research. Don't believe what I'm saying. Look at what happened when these particular policies, when they were implemented from 2015 to 2019, what happened to this country? Now, all this push, be it the pay tax or the personal income tax, is made to force Sri Lanka into having a budget surplus. However, a budget deficit is not something you need to Sri Lanka alone. It is something that almost all countries worldwide undergo, even America. Now, the current budget deficit in 2022, I, I think, is around $82 billion. Now, if you are one of those people who earn about, let's say, 200000 a month, you are considered in the middle income category. However, now, after the tax cuts, paying off loans, paying hefty prices at the supermarket and all other touch points where you might have to engage financially will result in only around 10 to 20,000 remaining as savings for you and your family or let's say for a, even for an emergency. Even that number, 10,000 or 20,000 is a high estimate. Mind you, this is after taking massive cuts and perks of what you were used to in that category. In the long run, these taxes will shrink the middle class sector, push most of them to the low income uh, families category and push more towards welfare. The shrinking of the middle class will result in a multitude of problems. Apart from the obvious issue of a reduction in disposable income, the borrowing rates will heighten and there will be visible frustration with the people, pushing the rise in domestic crime meaning stealing and looting will be something of an option for people who don't have anything. We will see an increase in a lot of petty theft. It's already happening. It will increase. That is a dangerous situation for everyone who believe in a peaceful society. Again, we don't have to look beyond. Look back at 2022. Well, what do you think? Are you okay with these taxes? Well, this is what some of you had to say. Salaried employees have been taxed from 6 to 36 percent based on their salaries. Ultimately, their take home salary have been reduced uh, drastically and it will badly affect to their standard of living. Personally, I feel because I have elderly and children dependents, so uh, these taxes I can't tolerate. Indirect taxes, we pay at the moment, we pay a lot of indirect tax, taxes. So that is also we have to pay and direct taxes also presently we have to pay. So I think this is very, very unfair. In terms of businesses, we will have to fight really hard for our survival. This is in view of the exorbitant taxation and the higher interest rates prevailing in this country. Pay tax imposed on the interest it cut. We are affected. We are very much affected by the interest income because income groups like us are not entitled for a pension scheme nor a provident fund. Therefore, we are very much dependent on the interest income for our retirement. Uh, definitely, business community will affect very adversely and uh, what we earn has to pay uh, bank as, as taxes and uh, ended up with nothing for us. So I think most of the business people will leave the country uh, looking for a better place for their business. Because of this, 
those reasons, especially most of the manufacturer now thinking to move in from Sri Lanka to outside. Some some people going to going to their industry to Middle East. Some people may Bangladesh and other places, especially garment industry and polymer manufacturer, compound manufacturer. Uh, a lot of people moving uh, from country to Sri Lanka to outside to uh, move their industry. So it is a very tough time to Sri Lanka manufacturer. So that's why we are requesting to government uh, reconsider the about the taxes and do some. Uh, some opportunity to survive the local SM industry. Bank interest rates are going uh, up and actually uh, especially com commodity prices are skyrocketing. Therefore, actually we have uh, this meager income. Actually, we have to uh, maintain our uh, lifestyle uh, according to the uh, some kind of standard. So, therefore, actually I am uh, uh, speaking on behalf of the professionals actually to uh, reduce this uh, tax uh, from the government. We have to educate our children also. That expenditure has also gone up. Uh, due to that, these reasons, we are in uh, very uh, big difficulties. We have to face uh, so many difficulties. Taxation is going to be placed on the very first stage of the, uh, the salary and uh, after all taxation and the loans and all this stuff uh, went on if you get uh, very less amount or uh, the amount which is not going to be sufficient to feed your family it's going to be a huge problem and uh, i think uh, that will cause many problems among the society and a lot of people i know uh, are thinking about maybe migrating or going abroad well, those were some of your views. Now, to understand whether these taxes would help the country or not, earlier I spoke to former finance minister, Dr. Sarath Thamurugama. This is what he said, listening. There is only one way forward, and that is to increase productivity and cut down expenditure. Because one, one part of our economy is that it is a foreign exchange crisis. You know, all those areas that brought us foreign exchange. So that can be uh, circumvented only by en enhancing those areas that brought us revenues. Tourism now is on the upswing. That is a very good sign. We have to enhance foreign remittances. And especially, we have to help the private sector to do a much more export-oriented, much more productive type of operation so that the country will get that type of foreign exchange and then we can, in the first step, go about those vital necessities like power, like transport, like health, like education. All those vital sectors can be financed. And equally, uh, what was disastrously mismanaged previously is that we must improve our agriculture so that at least food security for our people can be ensured. Well, that was uh, Dr. Sarath Amunugama, um, former finance minister, I think, during uh, President Mahindra Rajapaksa's time and also uh, beyond. Uh, he was uh, very much involved in our economic affairs and that's what he thinks. All right, uh, let's get an idea as to how much of an impact these taxes would have on your salary. And for that, let's uh, go to Danidu Tanuma. I'm standing by at the data board. Good to see you once again, Danidu. It seems like that you're standing in front of a board which says uh, salary LKR. Hundred thousand is this? Are, are you trying to tell the people that's how much you get? Uh, I think it's better not to commit. I will. I will exercise my right of being silent in this instance, uh, since I have to have this conversation with my boss. Uh, but my, uh, unfortunately, as uh, usual on the data board, uh, I don't think we'll have to share a lot of positive stories. And I think I look forward to even you would look forward to when I could come here and share something positive. Now, in today's case, what we are going to focus on, just to swiftly get into the numbers, is a person that receives a salary of 100,000 rupees. Now, this is considered to be the middle income category, or was considered to be the middle income category. I believe you'll explain further about what's going to happen to this middle class, the so-called middle class, in the future with the taxes to come. Now, I think uh, usually, Mahesh, you're not someone who is uh, new to complaints. You'll probably get a complaint on this segment saying the numbers that we have given are conservative estimates because I have gone for the best case scenario giving the benefit of the doubt for the government or those agencies and to see with 100,000 what is the capacity for a person in this middle class to survive. Now, 
we're going to look at a few obvious expenses like the payee tax, which, which will have the reduction coming down to 94,000. Then there will be the EPF, the things that are generally considered. Now these are calculated based on the basic salary of 100,000, not, not with any other additions. So you'll then bring it down to 86,000, what you can use as disposable income. Within what we looked at when it comes to rent, I believe a lot of people, I can hear them complaining, 20,000 will not be the number, it'll be much higher. But let's just say you are living within the outskirts of Colombo, that you are paying a rent of 20,000, bringing your, uh, the total disposable income to 66,000. Food, again, a very conservative estimate of 15,000. The government has uh, put the mark, landmark, the figure between 10,000 to 11,000, but let's just say 15,000. Bringing it down to 51,000, your disposable income. Electricity. Now this was calculated based on Mahesh, I think we did an entire segment on this as well, calculating the new tariffs, based on new tariffs, what the electricity would look like. Again, for a four member household, we are expecting it to come to a range of between 4,000, bringing your disposable income to 47,000. Then water. Now Mahesh, the calculation for water happens with 13.5 rupees per cubic meter of water with a service charge of 300 rupees. Based on that calculation, we are looking at a rough figure of 1,500 uh, 1, or 2,000 rupees, bringing your disposable income to 45,500. Then a one cylinder of gas, again, for four people, we are estimating 12.5 kilogram uh, gas cylinder would be sufficient for one month. So monthly expense of 4,400, bring your disposable income to 41,100. We are expecting this specific category of people to be driving in the car, but expectation of public transport can also bring it roughly at a minimum of 1,600, calculating the minimum bus fares for the outs outskirts of Colombo, bringing your disposable income to 33,700. Now in this scale, just taking those specific segments, Mahesh, we see the value remaining at 33,700. But you'll ask me the question, anyone would ask me the question, are these the only things that people spend their money on? I'm leaving out a lot of things. For, uh, just, to, just to include a few, if we take a car lease, for example, this is a car lease for a vehicle that's, a, that's 15 lakhs, 1.5 million. This is actually a very, very conservative estimate yeah. about how much you have to pay per month, between 50 to 30. For housing load, if you, there is an expectation, people build a family, they want to build a house. We are expecting a monthly payment of 30,000. This is re removing the 30% charge that you have to pay up front, the 70% that you pay over, over a certain period of time. Now the housing loan I actually calculated for 1 million rupees, which is definitely not the case, people go for something higher. Exactly. If you do calculate these two, leaving out entertainment, leaving out savings, leaving out education, leaving out healthcare. What that entertainment, right? <laughs> leaving out all of those aspects, we'll actually have a negative value that will come out. So I think Mahesh, you'll have to discuss this on a political and social aspect, how people are going to survive, how the middle class is going to survive. I know it's a little bit elitist of me to just talk about 100,000 salary because people, the, there's a majority of people below that. We saw exactly. that over 500,000 fell below the poverty line due to the COVID measures. So just to look at this demographic that watches our program, mm -hmm. they are finding it difficult. Over to you, Mahesh. Indeed, uh, that is that, that's a very well thought of the uh, segment that you just did, uh, just to g give our viewers, even the authorities, I don't know, uh, recently I saw a tweet uh, which said that apparently a very elitist category in our society, I don't want to say uh, which, which sector, apparently they have gone into the courts asking not to collect uh, income tax or pay tax from them right. because i don't know I, I think they get uh, somewhere around 500000 rupees uh, um, from from um, I, I, as I a mean, basic salary yeah exactly uh, that's a very comfortable salary and and yet they went to courts and apparently the courts have said that not to do it or not uh, I, I mean like there are a lot of things that we really need to think about. It is not about, uh, I don't understand why the government is so hell-bent on being IMF worthy, but apparently that's the drive the government is going on. And, and right now you just broke down to showcase what kind of uh, misery uh, that most of these people, the middle income class has to go through. Then uh, Dutan Wasam at the data board. Thank you very much. Let's dive deep into this story, and for that, uh, joining me now is Professor at the California Institute of Integral Studies, Professor Asuka Bandarage. Professor, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to me, and I understand that you are here in Sri Lanka from the U.S. for a very short visit, and it's an, a real honor to speak to you. Uh, Professor, recently an increase in income taxes was implemented. Uh, we, we've been talking about that entire thing right now. Uh, now the first round of taxes went through this month and most of the middle class is feeling the pain. Now it's evident that 
unfair taxes like this, we should not think about the people of uh, Sri Lanka, but just the goal the government wants to achieve, pushed by the need to be IMF worthy uh, nation. Professor, do you believe this sourness would push people towards another unrest like what we saw back in 2022? First of all, Mahish, thank you very much for having me on your show. Really appreciate it. Yes, I think it's hard to predict the future, of course, but we already see people demonstrating and resisting against these new uh, tax policies. So they are likely to intensify if there aren't uh, uh, breaks uh, given to people. Uh, the austerity program is already underway and people are feeling uh, the weight of it and it is the uh, the lower classes the middle classes and the poor who have to bear the brunt of this and i think it's important to have a broader perspective on the differential effects of taxation on different classes of people and in this regard we have to remember the great income disparities in sri lanka for example the world inequality database points out that the top 1% in Sri Lanka uh, control 31% uh, of personal wealth, whereas the bottom 50% has only, uh, they have access only to about less than 4% of uh, all wealth. So that in itself, you know, shows the vast uh, disparities that could only grow with uh, unjust uh, taxation policies and IMF-led uh, social service cutbacks and so on. So, uh, you know, it's very uh, commonly known that IMF uh, austerity and restructuring programs have led to so-called IMF riots around the world. So this is not just a phenomenon that is peculiar to Sri Lanka. Uh, with so many other countries in debt crises, we are going to see this uh, across the world. Absolutely. Uh, makes a lot of sense. So now, Professor, in the Colombo liberal clown circles, there is this insane delusion being entertained that homegrown solutions for a crisis like this will never work. But it will always be the IMF, Deyo and Western gods that will solve all problems of Sri Lanka. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's a very superficial and a, a misled policy. The minds have uh, most people, particularly uh, the so-called liberal middle classes, have been so deeply conditioned that they cannot think outside of the box, so to speak, of uh, economic fundamentalism, which is the neoliberal economic policies um, of privatization, of market-led growth. And I think if we are really talking about uh, solutions beyond the IMF bailout, we do have to think of uh, all that money that is uh, sitting outside of the country, the illicit flows of funds, uh, particularly from that top 1% who are also tax evaders and who are responsible for the outflow of illicit uh, funds abroad that are in you know offshore tax havens and banks that needs to be brought back to the country through an amendment of the uh, foreign exchange control act which is you know extremely important because that money that is uh, out there is far greater than the 2.9 uh, billion uh, from the uh, estimated from the uh, imf understood uh, professor what kind of advice would you give to Sri Lankans undergoing these severe hardships? Yeah, you know, um, I have a publication coming out on this uh, topic, and what I'm showing is that uh, this is a global uh, uh, crisis. Um, there are close to 60 low and middle income countries in debt crisis or near debt crisis. So, so there is a global discourse on moving away from the neoliberal model that the IMF is pushing to something that is much more sustainable, uh, a, a greater global discourse which is unfortunately absent in Sri Lanka, a discourse that calls for um, local self-sufficiency, local agriculture, local production, 
uh, and moving away from this extreme dependence on imports and exports, which is the legacy of colonialism. Uh, and in this regard, I think, you know, ultimately it calls for a change in thinking, thinking outside of the box, so to speak, and moving towards more collective ways of approaching these issues. Because what we have now is a model that upholds individualism, uh, extreme privatization and competition. And there is a global discourse on a transition to a more collective, more ecological way of living on the planet and sharing resources. And I think the tax issue also bears uh, into that. So I think we need more of a, a transformation of consciousness in order to have change in uh, economic policies. A lot of valuable information. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was Professor at the California Institute for Integral Studies, Dr. Ashoka Bandarage. Uh, this is State of the Nation. We will take a short commercial break. Back in a moment. Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Recently you saw how Indian External Affairs Minister S. Jai Shankar came to Sri Lanka saying India has good news to tell us. So what was that good news? Well basically they will say to the IMF that uh, India is willing to restructure the debt they have on Sri Lanka. Afterwards he held a media, media briefing with the President present and there he gave some indication of what India would like to do as we go on. Well, not to be an ungrateful buffoon, but basically India will inject itself uh, into Sri Lankan affairs, especially in the energy sector. As the Indian government is hoping to milk the best projects that are available in Sri Lanka, piggybacking on this economic crisis. Now, we also heard nuances of our neighbour to, uh, to the north indicating their interest in implementing the 13th Amendment, with which the current president is proceeding right now. Now, these are serious matters. As I mentioned last week, when we are at our lowest, we see the vultures roaming around our rotting carcass, hoping to grab the biggest chunk. On the other hand, the US is pushing us not to be self-sufficient and be an anti-China soldier in their cold war against China. Each and every country that came to Sri Lanka wanted something. This is why I tend to think, did we really have any real friends worldwide who genuinely wanted to help us at our lowest point? Or did they help us hoping to get the best deal for them? Well, let's get some uh, insights into how global affairs will impact Sri Lanka. And for that, joining me now is former Foreign Minister Ruhita Bugalagaman. Good to see you, uh, sir. Thank you very much for your time. Now, with the Sri Lankan economic crisis thickened, many countries, uh, Foreign Minister, especially India and the US, have tremendously increased their presence and engagement in this country. Now, some would even argue that the US backhandedly orchestrated the crisis of 2022 that resulted uh, in us being in this state. Let's, uh, for the moment, leave that aside until we get more evidence. But, uh, Foreign Minister, what exactly do you see in the recent engagement of these countries that could be a potential threat to our sovereignty and our affairs? Or is this engagement something positive? Uh, we have to look at my dear international arena in terms of being supportive of a country like that of Sri Lanka. We should not run into sometimes wild conclusions merely because there is power play between giants in the world, if you really uh, term that word with a greater or a detailed definition, the greatest uh, rise in the 21st century lies in Asia. The economic power that is now getting galvanized and also concentrated 
in the whole world lies as a foundation support coming from the Asian continent. We command uh, the, about half of uh, the world's population. Along with that, we have the giants in Asia like that of China, India and Russia. They are all countries located in the Asian continent. Therefore, when it comes to power play, we are in a very vibrant area or a location that is registering some type of currents, sometimes at high strength or sometimes in terms of in adverse manner, but we have to have a foreign policy that can manage these developments. That is the beauty of having a very uh, seasoned uh, along with that a mature foreign policy administration in a country like that of Sri Lanka. We have to get the best heat out of this developments that have taken place with alliances forming large between India and that of US. They are a very strong alliance that I see. Today the technological transfer being encouraged between US and India. Thereby, we will have to benefit out of all these locations that get centered with India and I look at that we have to play it not with any optimism, uh, but also with cautious uh, arrangements in terms of our individual bilateral relations. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, makes a lot of sense. Now, uh, Foreign Minister, Sri Lanka has opted to uh, be a non-aligned um, state and in my opinion it hasn't brought significant benefits for this, uh, to this country now amidst this crisis. Do, you, uh, do we still need to entertain that idea or should we opt for a better version uh, of our foreign policy? What we termed as non-aligned, I think is a bit of wasted word over the last several decades. Non-alignment was a need at a time when there was two sides in the world politics. That was the USSR dominance along with that of the US dominance that was having the free enterprise and democracy and we name it in terms of more uh, liberal world affairs. Now that period is gone. And today we had look at how best we could align ourselves in terms of national interest being protected, promoted and safeguard along with that economic prosperity for our people. So what is the policy that we can pick? And today we do not have to go into European uh, subcon uh, the continent or across the Atlantic to seek our prosperity. We have the prosperity right at the end of our boundaries. We have a closer link with uh, India which should get for the further promoted and along with that behind India is uh, China in terms of a geographical uh, demarcations. So, we have the size that matters to help us out in the current context and we do not have to call this non-aligned. What we have to say is we have to be aligned in terms of our national priorities. So, that we our prosperity lives in terms of having economic ties with India, why not we do that? irrespective of the world opinion getting cast in terms of we are, whether we are aligned or non-aligned. What we have to do is we have to pick our friends in terms of our need. If not for our friends at times of need, I do not think we would have been out of the woods uh, in the last six months. Today we are reaching more towards greater stability from where, where we were and we have to now pick and see who help us to come that way, that the road forward. So, that means our way forward lies in now picking a very strong foreign policy approach in terms of finding the correct partnership. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, sir, now China. We see that the Sri Lankan government's lackluster approach to China despite what the foreign minister says uh, that they are engaging uh, with China. But uh, we do not see a real push to engage China in the current affairs of things. And I honestly believe that if we do so, our crisis status would not be severe as this. Um, is omitting China a prudent move? No, I do not think we should omit a major power in the world. How can it be prudent, Mahesh? If you had to omit a next, I would say, economic power that is now rising at a tremendous speed from outside our so-called scope of relationship. So, why should we really omit any country for that matter? 
China has been a major contributor towards our growth. If not for China, we wouldn't have seen some of our roadways and our economic advancement in this country. The way we used our credit that was granted to us, the loans that were given to us, so sometimes liberally, have we used it properly? That is the fault of our, our governments in office during the last two decades or so or more. Why didn't we use our channels of support and economic uh, avenues for the greater benefit of our people? What were our priorities? So, therefore, we should not omit uh, China. China has given us and they will continue to give us more in the future, I believe, because they have now virtually I understand even on the credit bilateral credit uh, package, they are prepared to look at a moratorium towards our repayment of their debt. So, it is a big support for us at a time when we are struggling to get the green light from the IMF to go forward. So, I think uh, China-Indian relationship also will get measured in terms of between the two countries on a bilateral level, though they have border issues, they have a supremacy issue and also they have the hegemony in terms of the Asian context, but still for all, their economic ties I believe will go from further uh, to from strength to strength and it will have a very beneficial effect if for the whole of Asia and then to the rest of the world as well. So, the economic growth taking place in these two countries phenomenon and today we see the Delhi, uh, Delhi uh, uh, Mumbai rail link getting open 1200 kilometers of road uh, rail link, the fastest rail link uh, in Asia getting created sometimes maybe in between Mumbai and Delhi, but still having said that there is growth at a tremendous speed around us. So, I think we have to be the beneficiaries of that growth as partners in the region. All right, we have to leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much. That was the former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Rohit Abubulagama. This is State of the Nation. Back in a moment. Now, last year, by this time, end of January, we saw that people in this country were getting frustrated and daily prot protests were mushrooming. First, it was uh, due to the lack of supplies and then it turned out to be on the verdic uh, a verdict on our nation's leaders. Now, in 2023, this year, we see similar protests in uh, countries like Peru, Brazil, China and now France. Now, all these protests are aimed at one thing, regime change. This made me wonder, is Sri Lanka too a victim of such a regime change operation? And if so, who was behind it? Let's get more context to the, that story. Joining me now is a national security specialist and renowned author, Professor Rohan Gunradhan. Thank you very much, Professor, for your time. Uh, Professor, several regime changing protests have taken place in the, uh, in the recent past around the world. Now, most recently, one that we witnessed was from Peru. Now, do you think people everywhere in the world are genuinely unhappy with their respective governments, hence the protest? Or is there something else sinister at play? Mahesh, the world is moving between order and disorder, between stability and chaos. So we witnessed COVID, then after that we witnessed a global energy crisis, now a financial and economic crisis. So during this period, we have seen that the fringe parties have been very active in instigating protests to oust governments so that they can come to power. But what is important is for the public to be educated so that these social protests are not hijacked by political entities. In Peru, uh, Castillo, who was the president, was going to be impeached. And then what he did was he tried to dissolve the Congress. Now he's been arrested. 
And today, as a result of the continuing protests in Peru, Machu Picchu, which is the main tourist destination in that part of the world, tourism has been disrupted. So if we are going to maintain stability and security, it is imperative for governments to ensure that protests do not lead to further economic crisis and catastrophe, that it does not lead to uh, investors running away from a country. So maintaining stability and security is essential. It is vital. It is the lifeblood of the citizens of a nation. And if government is not attuned and oriented to these global developments, then certainly uh, the economies and the social stability will suffer. And we should not allow that. Absolutely understood, uh, Professor. Now, when comparing these protests uh, to what happened here in Sri Lanka, what are the similarities you see? Do you believe similar elements were at play in Sri Lanka and around the world? Certainly, we have seen in the Sri Lankan context, the protests were largely a result of the economic and the energy crisis the country faced. It is because the government leaders at that time did not understand the new domains of national interests, which is to maintain economic and financial vibrancy, to maintain energy, uh, health and medical supplies, food, and other essentials. So unless government leaders understand what is needed to sustain a nation, then from the fringe parties and even from the mainstream parties, people will protest and those protests can turn violent, it can cause a lot of damage and it can destabilize countries. So after the Arab Spring in two in 2010, we are seeing another wave of protests that the world is facing. And this is amidst geopolitical, uh, geoeconomic fragmentation. That is why we have to maintain a national security. We have to ensure that there is stability for Sri Lanka to economically recover. And during this period, if there is no understanding of all political parties, of all political leaders, certainly the country will not recover because tourists will not come here, investors will not come here. The country will move from an economic crisis to an economic catastrophe. Absolutely understood and uh, we should really do a, a separate program on this subject alone. We have to leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was National Security Specialist Professor Rohan Gunratna. This is State of the Nation. Back in a moment. Sri Lanka's most defining characteristic has been to do it, forget it, and repeat it. We see this happening in real time with what I would like to call two governors in the multiverse of madness. It's entertaining, but at the same time quite sad to see. How when one governor held the rupee, he was bashed and told to leave. And when the, another governor is doing the same thing at a higher rate to the dollar, but calling it soft pegging, praises, bouquets, and love all around especially from Dr. Harsha De Silva. Similarly, when one governor prints money, it makes headlines daily. And when another prints mo more money, pin drop silence by the liberal clowns who are really a bunch of slaves. This habit we will not let go of. It's attached to us like a toxic parasite that weighs this country down at every possible junction. Now, in the month of March, we are looking at another election. As usual, the pundits have taken to social media to push for the underdogs. In this case, the new face of the JVP, the NPP. Now, when I discussed uh, this on our podcast, I commented that if we go on like this, handing over the reins to the NPP is also an option that ca we cannot rule out. That is the problem because that would be done 
through desperation. And this desperation due to the abuse of people's aspirations by former President Gotabe Rajpaksa will result in the rise of a political power that may do far more damage than we can recover from. But it is not my place, or anyone's for that matter, to come against the people's mandate. This program, State of the Nation, was started to give a unique viewpoint that doesn't conform to popular bias but speaks the truth as it is. From the beach party to the clown circus, from the beginning to the end of the show, even in the production process, I give no space for bull. You can ask my producers. And it is that agenda that I have in talking about the issues of aspirations. We have to, with no excuses, be smart at this juncture in our history. With a heavy international involvement, we are at the possibility of losing this country that you and I call home purely because a few leaders decided to drop the ball. We are at that moment in history where we have to hurt feelings, weed out the snowflakes, and get our act together as a society, primarily because the leaders aren't doing their job. I remember celebrating our wins during COVID when we were a leading provider of vaccines, thereby protecting our people. We had the intention to win. I don't see that intention anymore. I don't feel that intention anymore. We need to find that intention back again. If not, the vultures will win at the end and then you and I will be left lamenting, oh my country, what happened to my country? On a programming note, make sure you listen to our podcast released weekly. This week we are discussing elections, the former president's damage to the nation, the nationalistic agenda and of course about the economy. I think this podcast is way too honest. You should certainly listen to it. The State of the Nation podcast available on Apple Podcast and Spotify. I'm Mahesh Johnny. From all of us at Other Than 24, have a good night and a productive week. I'll see you back again next Sunday.